Okay, so I'm here with Fallen One right now, and I got him into another after a pretty long hiatus. That's what people always tell me. It's been one month since they've seen another. I forgot all about it. <laughs> but we, we've been discussing it for a while now. We're both pretty into this series. So, just to follow up to my last video, I'm going to see if I can get a second opinion on it. So, someone who's recently watched it, you know, knows about the themes, the characters, all that stuff. What goes down with the plot. How did you feel overall? Like, what were your impressions of it? My first watch through, which was a while ago, I didn't really <laughs> look into many of the themes or characters because that's not really how I approached anime at that time. My second rewatch being this one, I'm at least looking at the series better, but the, the themes that it explores never really were my cup of tea, to put it bluntly. Okay, that's fine. I mean... <laughs> It, as far as it goes, it's not in my top five at all. It's not even anywhere close to my top five. So I still rank it as a nine out of ten, but it does have some serious flaws. And the themes it explores, are I, I think that they're good themes, but at the same time, they're a bit detestable, <laughs> to be honest. But just to make sure we're on the same page. I would page. say that the themes... Yeah, what are, what are they? I would say themes? Yeah, to you. Like, what do you think well, they are? I would say something. Hmm. You, you would probably argue it's that May is a bitch... <laughs> but that is a aside, funny thing. From, uh, aside from that, I'd I'd say futility is a large one. Futility in, in in what way? In what context? In the way that no one really controls their own life and that we can really only helplessly struggle against what the world throws at us. I, I feel that's something that the series really embodied. That that's just my opinion though. Well, that makes sense. That's that's the nature of the curse, right? That you can't really control whether it acts, especially once it's begun. You can't stop it yeah, unless you kill exactly. the extra. You, you have no control over it. Right. That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> Is that the only thing you thought of when you when you heard of it? Or Honestly, th I, I didn't have a very big connection to the series on my first watch. Okay. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. It's It's hard to connect to a lot of the characters on a personal level. A lot of my connections are more on an implicit level, which I'll probably get into a bit later. But I get that. As far as hating May being a theme... Sarcasm, my friend. Sarcasm. Well, I mean, at the same time, I can consider that a theme. Not hating May itself, but just the fact that there's a character who's supposed to be portrayed as one thing, but really they're another. And the show... Okay, pun, in, pun sort of intended. <laughs> and and the, show, <laughs> the show doesn't really tell you either way what to think of the show lets you draw your own conclusions it, i mean it, it makes them out to be one thing while the the characters in it well the main character in it koichi Sim simpabara views her as something else entirely which is good and so you're left to draw your own conclusions from that most think she's good a, a lot of people think she's bad as well though i'd personally say that's not necessarily a theme it's just them exploring a character well, what, what would you define as a theme? Because this is how I would define it. A theme is something that, well, in, in this case, going through a narrative, a theme is a an idea that runs throughout, a general idea that you can apply to, to real life that runs throughout the narrative and drives the narrative. With May, the theme is that she's viewed as a good person by the person who actually matters the most. He saves her life several times. But on the other hand, she does very terrible things. So it's, it's sort of about the two-faced nature of people in general. How, or, or, so you're saying mm -hmm. it's about duplicity. Is that, is that what you're implying? It's about duplicity, but at the same time, May never really puts on that face that she's a good person. So it's not as if she's really two-faced. It's just more that, people, it's more that people's perceptions of her are warped. At least his perceptions of her are warped. And other people try to... Get get him get him to come to his senses, namely Izumi, and he doesn't. That sort of happens with us in real life, right? Like there's a person we like, and we're trying to associate with them. Meanwhile, there's other people trying to say, "Don't go near this person. This person's a bad person." Whatever, and we don't listen. Whether or not we get burned by that isn't really relevant. However, that does happen in real life, right? Yes, it, it's reasonable to say that uh, another of its another of its themes. Pun definitely not intended in that, in that sense. <laughs> Another of its themes is that um, people are not how we perceive, perceive them. And should I say, people are very bad at judging other people, no matter 
how they think, how good they think they are. They are. A lot of, a lot of, well, with the context of Mei and Fujioka and how that affected her, she didn't let anybody know about that. So a lot of people, they see how she acts. I'm not talking about Koichi or anybody in the show, but people see how she acts and, and they only know how she acts because they have the context of what had happened to her in the past, but those in this show don't have that context. So it's like in real life, you don't know exactly how people are going to be one day to the next based on what happens to them in their everyday lives. So I, I, I sort of consider that to be a theme. I don't know if you have some sort of specific definition for theme that differs from mine, but yeah. just it, it's, it's reasonable to say that, I'd say. Okay, okay, cool. So then that's that's just me on my hating May tip. <laughs> Um, yeah, but, yeah. You obviously have. Um, but let's say you have a hate boner. A different way of looking <laughs> at the series, I, and that one of those different viewpoints is whether or not May is the main villain, which I'm still on the on the edge on that one. Well, as far as her being the main villain, I I can't deny the facts. If you look at the definition of antagonist who is someone who opposes the protagonist, Izumi is definitely the antagonist of the story, even though she's not a bad person. I use the term synonymously. What, what do you mean by synonymously? As in, I assumed you were saying that she's not necessarily yeah. a villain, but an antagonist. Well, uh, I was yeah. using the words interchangeably. Right. It, it, well, I, yeah, I was using it for Izumi. Iz, Izumi, oh, yes, yeah, Izumi is the antagonist of the story. Because you cut out yeah, my fault. He's, well, the antagonist opposes the protagonist. That's that's what the antagonist's role in a fiction, well, in any story is. They oppose the protagonist, whoever that so happens to be. The protagonist doesn't have to be a good person. Yeah. And they can be completely naive, in Koichi's case, times two. <laughs> so, it's only by circumstance that Izumi happens to be the antagonist. If, if, it's from, if it was told from her perspective, she would be the protagonist. And Koichi, well... Mainly, may would be the antagonist. So, mm-hmm. so and, I, yes, right. So I, I, I'd, mm-hmm. I'd argue if we're looking at it from a bird's eye view, even even not not necessarily all of us even see Izumi as the antagonist, and May as or May and Koichi as the main characters. We some of us arguably see that in a different light. Well, it goes like this. One, you can only have. I, yeah, you can't really argue. You can only have one main character. If you're using the actual narrative term, I mean, you can have characters like in roles of importance and you can call them main characters, but principally there's only one main character and that's the one who we see, unfortunately, the most, Koichi. Koichi simp- 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 that fucker. And then you have Mei, who I can't classify as a protagonist either. The reason being she... A protagonist has to act as an agonist. They have to act as an agent for a cause to lead the plot forward. They don't have to have she's some sort of... very indecisive in her actions. I'll, I'll agree with you there. She's very indecisive, and she works contrary to the, to the plot because the decisions lie on stopping the extra, well, later on stopping the extra, but one, identifying the extra, and two, stopping the extra. She identifies the extra very early on. We don't see exactly when she does it, but she does it at least... By the time that she asks um, Koichi, I mean, not Koichi, um, Shibiki, the librarian, about um, the fact that Reiko was in the class of 1996, I think that was in episode 5 or 6. So she does it at least around that time. At the very latest, she does it before the beach scene. Because during the beach scene, she remembers completely that she'd seen Reiko die two years ago, or one and a half years ago. So she's known this entire yeah. time that Reiko has been the extra, and she hasn't done anything. And now there's some people who argue, well, you know, you can you can know who the extra is, and you, it doesn't really mean anything, because if you know who the extra is, and you don't know that you have to kill them, well then, w- what's going to happen then? You don't really know what to do, and so you're sort of trapped, and I can understand why she wouldn't be wanting to kill Reiko or, or do anything like that, because how could a... a... What wasn't your argument that... She didn't know that you were able to do things besides killing the person. Well, the other people's argument is that since they're in ninth grade, the last thing they will think of is to kill the extra, even if they knew who the extra was. Which is very stupid, right? Obviously, it wasn't the last thing May thought of. 
it wasn't the last, it was the first thing May thought of. However, May decided, May's, May's position was this. If she didn't know exactly how to stop the extra, she wasn't going to try to stop the extra. She was so cynical and pessimistic and just completely defeatist after Fujioka's death that she not only decided that if it wasn't for if it wasn't for her to find out how to stop it she wasn't going to try to stop it she decided that she wasn't going to try to find out how to stop it she she was going to just let whatever happened happen because she felt hopeless that there was no hope for anybody and that the countermeasures Izumi and and you uh, Yumi and Takako and Junta and, and all of them the teacher Chibiki they were just wasting their times and that they were going to die. I would disagree that this proves that she is inherently a bad person or someone deserving of hate. I, um, I remember you told me that you almost came to that conclusion but changed your mind after um, considering episode zero. And why, why did you um, relent on forgiving May after watching that episode? Well, I'm the type of person who tries to give somebody as much leeway as possible until I can't give them any more leeway. I had been thinking this much about May the entire time I was watching episode after episode. And I was like, why the heck isn't she going to say anything at all? I mean, she's in a position where she can find out things. She's just in a position where she can find out things. As soon as I saw that her eye is able to see death, which I think she said like is soon, like pretty soon after she revealed her eye, or, or something like that, I think. She said early on that her eye is able to see death. I know it was before the beach, because before the beach, she was like, you're not the dead one, don't worry, you're not the dead one, right? It, which means she, at that point, she most likely had already seen Reiko, since she'd written on her desk weeks earlier, who is the dead one. So we, we know going in, for the first time throughout the show that she's holding stuff back for no reason and that really made me pissed off at her and I tried to say why would she do this what what reason is there to justify her being such a prick and an asshole and I said you know what there isn't because even when you go back to Fujioka and I felt really sorry about Fujioka at, at first when she first said that her sister died huh Wait, I'm just make, making sure you didn't have a point there no, no, I was, I was listening to you. Okay, my fault, my fault. I get, a, I get a little bit of a... I have to get some context to my reasoning, right? So sorry if I, it sounds like I'm yeah. rambling, but I'm going somewhere. <laughs> at, at first, and this is from a first watcher's point of view, before you even see episode zero, because you're supposed to see episode zero after the series. She t talks to Koichi after making a fool of Izumi, thanking Koichi for sticking up for her, whatever the hell that means. And then she's like, I, my sister died. And then she drops that bomb, even though she said it was her cousin at first, but, she, but then she reveals that it was her twin sister and all that stuff. And that she, she feels like she, she just felt helpless. She couldn't do anything. And I would get that, aside from the fact that she would be leading to the deaths of about a dozen people, maybe, maybe more. I, 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 I had counted before. Like, you remember the conversations we had before. I actually counted the amount of people who were indirectly deceased as a result of May's inaction. However, I would say that's not necessarily, um, what is the word? It's not grounds for excuse, but it's, it's understandable that she would do this because of the way she was mentally impacted by that death. And she thought it literally was hopeless. It wasn't her putting on any personality or faking it as far as I know. She genuinely believed that if she couldn't do it, who could? But it goes beyond that. Because once you see episode zero, and episode zero was the episode that brought me into that perspective. For just a second, for just a quick second, it made me think maybe May's perspective is she she's just completely destroyed by that. And the fact that she punched a glass mirror and she's not the type of person to do that at all, she's weak as fuck, is very shocking. And it made me think that her personality was sufficiently impacted to the point where she's just gonna become Irrational, and you'd have to excuse that, I guess. However, then you get into the second Roch, <laughs> right? And then you see that from the very beginning, she is a terrible person. She is, she is consciously terrible. It's not as a result of what happened to her with Fujioka, and she's just not in her right state of mind. She knows exactly what she's doing. She's completely culpable. When she sees Koichi on that rooftop, you know what she does to Koichi? I, I do not. She, she tells Koichi 
Well, first she sees that Koichi doesn't know about the curse. He, she, he doesn't know any, anything about Class 3 at all. And she asks him, so she's like, you, you don't oh, know? Wait, they wait, haven't told you? Is that the when she teases him? Right, that's when she teases him. That's, that's back in, uh... Damn, I think episode one, actually. That's back in episode one. The very first episode, she teases him. And she's like, they, they haven't told you? And then she breaks the seal with him on purpose. But she doesn't just break the seal with him. She does it in a way so that he would keep going back to her or go back to others about her so that he would break the seal over and over again. And he would cause confusion in the class and chaos in the class. And she knows that in the end, it doesn't matter that's why she feels it's, it's there's no point even if she takes that risk even if she takes what other people perceive as a risk with their lives to her it's just fun and games because she knows there's no real consequence for it however she does it in a way that it's reasonable to i'd say it makes sense that she might have had certain personality disorders that were amplified by the um the initial trauma of her sister's death i mean that's something that occurs in real life. If she has a personality disorder, we don't know of him, but that still wouldn't make her not a villain. In the context of... Well, yes, it doesn't excuse, it just explains. It ex right, it explains, and I can, I, I'm the first person who will try to justify a character if they do something bad. If they're not like King Hamdo from um, Now and Then, Here and There, who was basically, if you don't know, he's basically a Hitler ripoff. And he does pretty much what Hitler would do, except he's more heavily into child soldier exploitation. Then you will mm -hmm. you will be able to justify them in some way. You'll be able to empathize with them usually in some way if they're not that bad. You can usually see their line of thinking, but it's admittedly a bit harder with me because right. you're not you're not given a lot of context as to why she does certain things. Right. The only the only reasonable conclusion you can draw is that she's having fun with it. One, because she says she has fun being made non existent. She says that to Koichi. She says, I find it fun. Like, pretty much verbatim, that's what she says. So it obviously hasn't gotten to her. And she didn't care from the from the moment she was made non existent. She didn't want to be made non existent, but she wasn't talking to anybody anyway. So she didn't make an effort to go into that. And even if she even if she didn't want to be made non-existent after the fact, even if she cared, she didn't bother to tell anybody that she didn't want to be made non-existent. Now, of course, you can't do that during class, but you can do it after class. And you could do, relay it to another teacher or something. You just can't associate with class three in a class three context. So obviously it didn't matter that much to her. But the fact that she keeps associating with, with Koichi over and over again, and the fact that she knows exactly what she's doing, you, you can't say that she's, I guess you're trying to say insane, because she... No, I'm more interested in the underlying reasons that that does amuse her, as in what would make her mentally enjoy that. What would make her enjoy that? When she goes by Sakakibura, <laughs> if, you remember, if you remember that from the, um, from the uh, rooftop, by Sakakibura. That's, that's, I guess that's more accurate to how she sounds. She she sound, she sound she doesn't talk like that, for one. I mean, her voice is pretty low, but she doesn't sound like she's trying to do a bad ghost impression. That's not her, her tone. So she's obviously screwing around. The question is why. And the only answer that you can give is just the fact that she doesn't care because she realizes... Yes, but I'm more interested in the reason she doesn't care, not It's because she, she thinks she... Well, I mean, look at it in this context. Your, your sister has died, right? Your, your twin sister, as she put it, her, her other half, right? Her missing other half or whatever. She meant that literally. Fujioka was the only person she ever associated with, aside from artificially her, her, her foster mother or whatever, Kirika, her fake mother, who she didn't like. Fujioka was the only other person she ever talked to. Now, obviously, if she tried to talk to class, they weren't going to, but after class, she could have. And she, she sort of associated with people like outside of class 3-3, three, three, but not really, not not in the same context, you know, just like the passing by, saying hi to everybody and that stuff. Fujioka was the only real close person she ever spoke to. And so when Fujioka died, that really, it not only made her feel empty, but it made her feel hopeless because that meant that- the I, I, would, I would assume that when someone that is essentially your whole world is no longer with you, it, it can be very impactful, but I'm, 
I, I get that it is impactful. That's quite obvious. I'm just right. wondering in what ways it does impact her. Right. Because well, it, it made her. It made her realize. Action, the last. Yeah, we know her actions, and we know what. Yeah, I know where you're, I know where you're going. Them, but I, I want to know what happened in between that sense. That that was the main interest of uh, of that discussion for me. Right. I, I get you. It's all in the context of the calamity. It's. The last thing she wanted was for Fujioka to die, because at that point she was in class three, right? And that meant that the calamity was going to start if someone there died. The calamity operates in the context of this. If you're, if you're in class three, and it's during school, and someone who can be killed by the calamity technically, which is basically you and any of your family members to the second degree, die, it's a, a death as a result of the calamity. That's how it's ruled. Whether or not it is or not is just whatever but that's how it's ruled if you're a target of the calamity and you're affected by it then it's the calamity's fault so when fujioka died she realized that not only did she lose her other half and that she was devastated but she felt hopeless because she felt that they were all gonna die or at least a lot of them were gonna die and their family members she, she so she just gave up <laughs> she she pretty much just said fuck it all from her point of view it's it's possible she blamed herself she was the one the curse was targeting. Well, the curse doesn't. Tar a lot of people say that the curse targets specifically as if it's sentient. I okay. Well, I think it, she was the curse was affecting, which led to her sister's death. Right. I I get, I get what you say if you say target. However, it when I say when I I might say target too okay. sometimes, but it to yeah. me target is more like you just happen to be the one who's being affected by the curse at that point in time. Like it doesn't select. No, I, I was saying, I'm not sure if you heard me, I might have cut out, but I was saying mm -hmm. she was the one that the, the curse was afflicting, and therefore it, she might have blamed herself for her sister's death. Well, it, it's, I, I guess, I, I guess I get that position. I haven't thought of that before. It's, the curse affected Fujioka directly. If you're, if you're getting killed by the curse, then you were cursed. Yes, However, yeah, I do get what you're saying. It was her fault because she was the link. Right, yeah, she was the link. She was in class system. three. I, I get that. I would be more, yeah, I, I understand that. However, she probably could have avoided it if she had told her sister that she had leukemia as soon as she found out. Because she found out a, a, at least a week, like several days before the fact that she fell out that Fujioka fell out and then was put in a hospital and was uncurable at that point. She could have stopped it early because as soon as she found out, it had already started to happen. Like it had just started happening. So it was her inaction. If that's one thing she wants to blame herself for, it's the fact that she didn't take measures or alert her sister so her sister could take measures. She just kept it silent. So she doesn't really have anybody to blame. She doesn't have an excuse for that. I think the only thing she, she is thinking is that we're all going to die. That's what she says to Koichi. She didn't think there was a way to stop the curse, so she just resigned to her fate. She says that later on in the series, about about um episode ten, I think. So I get that she, I get that she was hopeless, but I'm not sure that that was necessarily the main motivator. I think it was more a side effect, a side effect of the motivator being that she blamed herself. She could blame herself, but it wouldn't. The only reason, the only reason I say it wouldn't make sense is because she had every chance to tell Fujioka about the curse that Fujioka was being affected. Well, that, that's not the main thing. I, I, I was just say that's not like the main connection I was talking about. She, I was thinking she might have irrationally blamed herself for her sister's death, which might have provoked the development of such a cynical and uh, sociopathic personality to arise in her. I guess that makes sense, her blaming herself for her sister's death. But even then, it doesn't justify, I mean, it, not even justification, but it doesn't, it doesn't, not on a one-to-one -one basis, it doesn't explain why she would act the way she did to everybody else. For instance, when Izumi's brother died from the same curse, she did, I know, and I know people operate differently, but when Izumi's brother died from the same curse, she not only didn't, she not only joined the countermeasures, right, and, and tried to do all that to save her class, knowing that they were coming up next, she didn't take it out on anybody. There is, there is no reason to take out your, what you acknowledge as your own shortcomings, your own fault, on somebody 
else. To the extent but of they're murder. They're all different people, though. They're different people, but to the extent of murder uh, that many times, to the to the point where Koichi would go to her and say, you know, you you um Takabayashi died, the heart disease guy, and she was like, oh. Uh, I can get her saying that it's her own fault, but that's sort of a different context than her not caring at all that other people died. It's sort of two separate issues, I, if you know what I mean. It, it, it goes along with her mental instability. She, she obviously wasn't as stable as the other characters just by the way she developed. She was isolated and very emotionally dependent on that person. Uh, Kobichi? I mean, no, Fujioka? Yes. She she was dependent on them, but what do you think changed when she found Koichi that led her to become a slightly better person who cared about stopping the curse? I, I was under the impression that she just shifted her dependence onto that person and that that was at least what I got out of from it. Well, that was a bit of a trick question because it, well, at least in my opinion, is Koichi has no bearing on it. <laughs> It's, it's actually, huh. sorry, but it, but it's, it, no, it's, it's really the fact that when she goes to Koichi and all that stuff, she's all right with him at, at, at first. She finds him a bit annoying. She later develops feelings for him, but even when she finds out to kill the extra is how to stop the curse, what she doesn't do is she doesn't go ahead and kill the extra for Koichi's sake. She doesn't try to do that. She tries to make sure that Reiko is hidden from Koichi so that he not only has to not kill her, you know, he doesn't have that burden to, to bear, he doesn't even know that she is the extra. So she, she's basically... That's her. Right. And, and But later on, That's it gets to the point where she's just like, F fuck it, I have to kill her. I have to kill her now, even if I have to sneak out in the middle of a, a bunch of explosions, I have to find this girl and kill her because she's gonna get, she's gonna ruin everything. She's gonna ruin all of our lives. Primarily, that if anything, that strengthens my point that she didn't want Koichi to have any reason to leave her in any capacity. Similarly, she might have eventually decided that it was too much of a risk to let this person still survive. But why would it? Well, I guess I can get that, because at first she didn't care. That was when she wasn't doing anything. How, however, you know that every day you don't do anything, there's a chance that you can die from the curse. Every, every hour, every second you don't do anything, there's a chance that you can die from the curse. Besides that, I'm not sure what it is. I still don't get exactly what it is in letting these people die that has to do with an emotional connection to them. Because no, she, I, I'm saying that she doesn't necessarily care about those people. Right, that's true. <laughs> you can't you can't deny that. But so you're saying she only she only acted at the end for Koichi's sake. Either that or her own, yes. Her own Well she doesn't give a fuck that, she doesn't care about herself. No, her own sake being that she wanted Koichi to exist, not necessarily for his interests in particular. Okay, I can get that. Yeah, yeah, she... The only thing I would say is that I don't get why she... Well, I, I know it sort of jumps around a lot with the dates, but we know that she doesn't say anything after she's into Koichi. She doesn't even try to tell him about the extra, but she also doesn't try to find out the truth about the extra up until... Well, actually, no, she never does. She only happens to be in the place where they're looking for the extra. When, um, what's his name? Koichi and Yuya, the pretty boy with the, the brown hair, and Teshigawara, Naoya Teshigawara, the guy, the guy, the athlete guy, they go to the school, right, and they're trying to find out the tape that Koichi conveniently heard Katsumi talking about, and he was the only one who heard it. Those three of them convened to go and look for that tape in the old class three in the other school. But... I would... This thing I would think of in a person, a similar scenario, that there are a lot of other people that it's are mo much more likely to die than anyone that I would care to die, so I have time. It's probably some weird thing that I would think of. I mean, it's literally all random. It, it, it could even be your family members, and that's random too, is, you know, to the second exactly. degree. But my point is that she, she doesn't try to find out even then. She happens to be there. She's just drawing in that art room in the old school. 
and she well not in the old school i think in the in the new class no it might be in the old classroom yeah in the old in the old um school she's just trying to be alone and draw because she's emo and then they find her there and she's like what are you doing there and then they basically have to say what they're doing there because yuya comes and he <laughs> reveals that they're doing something top secret so then that's when she goes to look for the the, the tape the cassette tape before that, she has no interest in it. Well, at least she doesn't know about it, and she's not looking for it. You can tell by the fact that she's drawing that she's it's not on her mind. With Izumi, she has to take care of Takako at that point because Takako was mentally unstable. So she literally can't leave Takako <laughs> without Takako doing something stupid. So that's an, that's an excuse for her. I just find it funny. I'm just going to go on a, a bit of an aside here. I find it funny that everything May does wrong, Izumi has an excuse for. That's probably another theme here. It's very black and white to the point that I feel embarrassed talking about it, honestly. And I felt embarrassed talking about it for the longest time. Because every time I see something wrong with May, Izumi is the exact opposite. And it makes me think I'm a fanboy. And I know I am. I don't I don't really give a shit, right? I, I know I'm, I'm like the biggest Izumi fanboy ever. But it makes me wonder if my claims are validated by the actual show. Like if I'm not overlooking something. Because May, there is, there's really no excuse for what, what happens with her. She just doesn't care. I mean, I know you can explain why she doesn't care. It might be because of her sister, but at the end of the day, she just, she just doesn't care. I guess that's what you would call edgy. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Right, I mean, I mean, if if it's if it has to do with her, I don't know if I explain my point well, but if it has to do with her sister, she she should know that Fujioka would not like that. What she's doing, I, I mean, I know that's appealing to emotions right there, but she should know that. <laughs> that's not something people necessarily always think about. True, that, uh, that's not. But then you have the fact that she just she didn't care either for Koichi. So I. I get, I get that she snapped after her sister died. Is that how you would justify it in the end? That she just, after her sister died, she just stopped caring? Up until she just had enough? That's not necessarily how I would justify it. I'd say she only cared about very particular things and she lacked motivation in particular. Definitely lacked motivation. She cared about particular things like what? As in she didn't really have anything that she did particularly care about. Until she obviously, you know, had Koichi. When you say had Koichi, do you mean when she fell in love with Koichi? No, I just mean when she eventually developed um, a connection. Okay. It, I okay. Just just trivia. Would you put it on the same level as her connection to Fujioka? No, I'd say she is um, using him. As a, a, a substitute, as a, as a rebound kind of thing. So you think that she doesn't have feelings, feelings for him, or do you think her feelings for him aren't as strong? Because because it's a different type of feeling. She does, I think, she does love him. Yes, but just I just one. I think they're born out of using him as a direct replacement. So it's not like true love, is what you're saying? I'm saying it's it's very tainted in its origin. So you're saying that it. She well, she obviously loves Koichi, and she doesn't love Fujioka. Not like that. So, what are you saying? Are you saying that her love, her romantic love, isn't as strong as her her I guess sisterly love for her sibling? At least not until the end. Why not until the end? Just because of her actions. They they don't seem to be that stupid sheep. They don't seem to be <laughs> in keeping with the feelings being equivalent at that time. Okay. Yeah, there's... Just the fact that she'd never spoken to anybody but Fujioka at that point is pretty case evidence for she felt stronger for Fujioka than she felt for Koichi at the time. Mm -hmm. That was my thinking exactly. Yeah, and she... I, I, even if I hate her, I do have to explain her actions, putting a Fujioka asterisk on him, because... She probably wouldn't have been the way she was if Fujioka was alive. Well, I mean, obviously she wouldn't have had that death. <laughs> the, the death wouldn't have happened, so she wouldn't be... Well, you, you know, yeah, you can still do it. She, she wouldn't be breaking the seal if Fujioka was alive, right? There wouldn't be any reason for her to do that. 
Yes. There was no reason for her to do it until after it happened. Maybe you could say in some alternate universe she is just that much of a troll. But I, I get that they're born, their feelings born out of despair for her sister. That said, she is still a bad character because of it. Not a badly written character, but she is a dick. That's all. That's the only way you can describe her. She's a she's a dick, and she loves she mindlessly mindlessly loves two people. I would describe anybody I, who acts like her in those same shoes. I I wouldn't I wouldn't just be partial to anybody but May. I I don't have a hate bone for May. Trust me. I'd say she she makes a lot of mistakes and she's not a perfect person, but she's not not necessarily a bad one. Well, how else would you call someone who does what they're doing willingly? There was justification, is what I'm saying. She, she, zero to ten, zero being a horrible person. She's maybe, a, maybe a two or a three. Well, she's not completely evil. She's just, she's just very, very close. I, I mean, when she makes light of the curse, she's also making light of Fujioka's death herself. When she's like, it may have already begun. You could say that she's trying to, you know, come to terms with what's happening, with, with what's happened to her and her sister. But at the same time, she knows her sister's died, and she's just brushing it off as if it hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. That's definitely a way of thinking about it, but I, I don't honestly think she... <laughs> again, Ten being the, the picture of a saint and Zero being absolute bastard. I, I yeah. just honestly can't give her anything... Less than a two. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't I just, give her a zero. She's she. You have to literally kill somebody then, <laughs> right? She didn't yeah, she, actually kill anyone. She had flaws and she did bad things, but she wasn't irredeemable. Well, 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 she wasn't redeemed though. No, but she she theoretically could be. There's there's room for it. She she did nothing that can't be redeemed, in my opinion. Well, it would take killing her twelve plus times. Plus, whatever redemption she would have to perform for her to redeem herself. We'll, we'll, agree, to, we'll agree to disagree there. I mean, because when you have death on your hands that many times, you, you can't just redeem yourself. I feel she could atone for it. The, the best she could have done was to, to come back to the classes subsequently, you know, the subsequent uh, class threes, and say, who's the extra? And then they could figure out what to do at that point. That's the best she could have done, besides completely irrelevant. I have the impression that she would be doing this. I mean, why wouldn't she? Because it doesn't say she would be. the The impression we get is that it's over. Koichi says, "Is it finally over?" And then May is like, "Yes, it's over." And they'll talk oh, soon, I, I, and that's I, it. I never assumed that was the curse in general. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Koichi was asking, he said, like, is the killing over, the violence over, all that stuff? And then May was like, yes, and then... That's but but the I was under the impression that was only for this year. Yeah, so we don't know for sure whether or not May's actually going to come back to the classes. Like, if she well, has well, someone... no reason for her not to be. Well, she, she's literally <laughs> the only one that could do this. Because she doesn't care. <laughs> it's, it's because she True. hasn't proven herself as that type of person. If Izumi had her eye... You know, not to fanboy again, but Izumi would be back there. If well, May no, had no, someone... No, she wouldn't. No, no, she wouldn't. Izumi is dead, so... I knew you were going there. I knew you were going there. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Izumi had her eye and Izumi was alive, she'd be going Oh, there. okay. I don't think Izumi wants to, to leave where she's at right now, regardless. <laughs> but, leave death? Well, if, if it's how May describes it, then she probably would, but I don't think it's how May describes it. I don't think it's just complete darkness. Because May didn't actually experience death. She experienced an eye surgery when she was four years old. And I'm not even sure how she remembers it. But anyway, it's getting, getting back. Getting back. I, I mean, if it doesn't have to be easy. I, I, didn't, it, I didn't know there was anywhere to get back to anymore. Well, I said if easy me. <laughs> I mean, she, she, says, she says a lot of stupid shit, May. That you can call her out on. So I just, I tend to run away with it. But it doesn't have to be easy me. It could be anybody who's in a, pos- a superior position to May. Who, like, all of the countermeasures are, are in a superior position to May. The teacher was in one. Her, uh, who? Reiko was in one. Well, you know, Reiko died. But all the teachers who weren't in class three, like the non-class three teachers, they agreed to go with 
the, about the countermeasures we're doing. So basically, yeah, anybody, feel, yeah, could have asked I feel her. We have sufficiently discussed this topic, if you know <laughs> what I mean. I'm sorry, I hate her that much. I just, I just. Well, did I change her mind? <laughs> That's what I'm wondering. No. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, st- I'm still of the opinion that she is redeemable. That she could, she could atone for what she has done. She could, but it's unlikely that she will. Just based on what we see at the end, it's unlikely that she has any motivation to go back to that place. That she will. Huh? I will. I will concede that it is unlikely that she will. Well, then I'll concede that she can. She possibly can. There, there's always a little bit of light for most people. Yeah. Deep down, she's not a bad person. She, she's just very rotten, and you have to get to the she's core to find. Just the bad things. <laughs> yes. That shape her character and everything she stands for. But <laughs> yeah, we get it. You hate her. Let's, let's, let's move on. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, that being said, that's a lot you can say about that one character who who didn't even have much of a... Well, okay, I, okay, you know, I can say she had character development. After that conversation, she did have character development. It's not the most extensive character development ever, but she did have it. So you can't really say that she's as bland as I was going to say she was at first. I was thinking the only person in the entire show with any real character development was Izumi. Now, I'm not going to get into Izumi because that's a completely separate topic that would take forever for me to to go into. (laughs) I I would literally be here for days and days. Yes, I would be talking to myself in front of this before I talk to you about Izumi because I know you have a life. So... (laughs) I would, I would be here forever. But everybody else doesn't have that much characterization. They don't even have as much characterization as May. We, we talk definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel that works in a storytelling perspective, as long as they're not going for the deaths to be very meaningful emotionally. That is one thing I can't... Uh, well, it depends. In this case, I can't agree. I know, it's, I know it's all up to your personal reactions to how they died, or when they died, or anything about that, about their deaths. But I, I can't agree. All of the deaths in this show had some sort of impact to me, except for the people who really deserve to die, like Kazumi, crazy knife motherfucker. He, he deserved to die. But most everybody else, I felt something for their deaths. But before I get into why I did, why don't you explain your point a bit more? I'm just saying that most, most of the deaths themselves didn't have a lot of personal impact. Yeah. And that... They worked from a storytelling perspective, but that was about it, if you know what I mean. They they made sense within the scope of the narrative in the sense that we could imagine the characters feeling the emotions that we ideally would be, that they simply didn't have time to develop. When you say from a storytelling perspective, though, do you mean it has any bearing on the actual narrative? I mean, it so works some of them do. within the... It works within the confines of the story, but it doesn't work as a way to emotionally hit the average viewer. So they're just stark matter-of-fact deaths is what you're saying. They just happen, and they, they make sense with the story. Yes, it makes sense. And they, they serve the purpose, and they set tone, but they don't evoke an emotional response they could with enough development to their characters. Okay. Well, when you say they're characters, are you saying the characters, they don't develop the response to... Because there's a difference between your reaction and the, the reaction of the characters in the story. So just making sure... They don't develop them enough as people, is what I'm saying. They, for their deaths to be really impactful to you as a viewer. What about to the characters? Uh, what do you mean to the characters? Like, for instance, Kubadera's death on the rest of the class. Like I said, it works storytelling-wise. It... Well, but yeah, it's not just storytelling rise, though. It's, it's, if, if a character feels invested in something, you're more liable to feel invested in it, too. So if the, especially the main character, cares or gives a shit about anyone who's died, you're more likely to because they'll make you have a reason to. If you don't understand why you should be feeling sad, you can at least empathize with that main character's despair yes. and have it as well, some sort like of proxy. Said, it, it, it works within the story, but it, it doesn't reach the point it could if, if the show itself was longer and had more time to develop its characters. I, I think it depends on which character you're referring to. Most of, most of the people that are killed, usually they're given more development 
as com comparatively to how long they're going to be on screen as opposed to how much their deaths are supposed to impact the viewer. You mind repeating that again? I, I, I mean, I heard you clear, but I didn't really understand it. Just say it one more time. For instance, Izumi is given a lot of development comparatively to most of the other characters that die, and that's because she's intended to be there for longer. Right, but what makes Izumi's death sad isn't necessarily the amount of development she got, it's the type of development she got. She got development as a, like I said, the black and white. She is basically the personification of justice and all that is good in that show. And like I said, I'm going to sound like a fanboy, but that's, that's really what she is. Scarce the, any faults with her. She is good. She is nice. She is sweet. She has noble intentions. She's almost suicidal in her desire to help others because she puts herself in a position in the first scene of the of the show or the second scene technically speaking she puts herself in a position where she doesn't know that it's the extra and it's not but when she's shaking koichi's hand on that bed she's trying to find out whether or not he's the extra so she's she's gonna touch the curse if he is so she's literally putting herself in danger she's almost a martyr for her class it's not really fair to compare her, someone that self self not self-righteous but actually righteous to anybody else because nobody else is that selfless of a person in most of fiction i'm not saying how righteous i'm saying that she gets development at all and obviously the type of development defines the type of reaction but i'd say the quantity is correlative right well you can like let's put it this way for, uh, what's her name? Reiko, the aunt. You remember how she dies? She dies, um, screaming for her nephew not to kill her with a pickaxe in to the neck. And she doesn't know that she's the extra. And she is swearing that she's not the extra and not to listen to May. May has some pretty convincing evidence that she is, but it's not solid. It would have been solid if she'd said it back when Fujioka died, but since she waited until the seal was broken, it wasn't because it could have been it could have been the faculty seat or it could have been the seal. It could have been either or. And the fact that she said, oh, I remember back in 1996, I saw her die. There's no way to prove that at all. So it, it leads to without Izumi being alive because Izumi also remembered and her cousin, I mean, her brother was the one who did it, who killed her. But without any of that, you have basically Reiko about to, she's, she's getting beheaded by her own nephew and she's begging him not to. Everything is against her, and she doesn't know why, and she dies not even knowing she's the extra. And she, just before then, she'd gotten knocked out, literally, just to protect May, who at that point has no qualms about killing her. Now, you're supposed to feel really sad about that, because even though she's the extra and she's the cause of all these deaths, she has no idea about it and she can't control it. And she, she's, a, she's trying to stop it at the same time. She's the one who organized that trip to the shrine where they all met that terrible fate. However... Throughout the story, she doesn't have much death, and that's mainly because she doesn't remember much because she's the extra herself. Pretty much anything outside of her bubble of 1998 where she was revived, she's not going to remember because it's either going to be rewritten memories or if it has anything to do with the previous curse, sis, including the one that affected her, is going to contradict the memories she was reincarnated with. So she doesn't have much death. But a lot of people feel sad for her. So it's, it's, not mainly the, the type, it's not mainly the amount of death a character is given. It's the type of death. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying, it's right? Quantity. <clears throat> the amount of time a character is, that is spent developing a character isn't equivalent to how developed they end up being. Okay. I can agree to that. I, I can agree to that, but at the same time... Well, when it comes to death, I don't think you need to develop them that much for the death to be that impactful. You get what I'm saying? I don't think you need to spend that much time to develop them either way. Yes. I'd say it gets more impactful, but there's a certain point of diminishing returns, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a point of diminishing return, but that also increases the more that you show them. Like, the more time you spend with a character the more obvious it'll be in a show like this that they are probably going to die. But besides that, yeah. most of the characters in that show were douchebags. 
Yuya was okay. He wasn't a douchebag, but he made some stupid mistakes. Teshi Guerrero was a douchebag. He he punched Cosme and and threw him off the balcony just because he thought Cosme was the extra. And then Cosme went insane and started killing people. Um, who else was a douchebag? Takako was a she was an idiot, but she had a mental breakdown and she was no longer the same person. So if, for example, Teshi Guerrero had a death, he would have had more development more development with the main character so we overall would have gotten to see him more not just off-screen development and he would have had a death at the end takako would have had about an episode and a half altogether of development not counting her scenes where she's insane and then she would have died <clears throat> i guarantee you more people would have felt sorry for takako than they would have felt for Teshikawara. and the reason being is because takako when she died she only Th that those two episodes I think where she died she'd only gotten any characterization in half of them <laughs> she was only there for about half of them so about an episode at the most of characterization but the nature of her death was that she she just wasn't the same person all of those previous deaths and especially Junta's at the beach when he got that aneurysm and then hit by the boat it it just got to her she yeah, that, that was funny I have to admit that was funny that was funny yeah. How is that funny? Aneurysm into death by boat. That's 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 something. <laughs> that's some freaking final destination shit, in my opinion. That's, that's what everybody says. They say, they say it's final destination. <laughs> terms. Terms are butchered, man. N nothing means anything anymore. I mean, I can sort of get how it's like final destination. But to, to be fair, he, he was dead before the boat hit him. Otherwise, it would have violated the rules of the curse. He, he was dead as soon as that aneurysm struck. So he didn't really have... Yeah, he didn't have a chance. I mean, it, it, they, they found that out afterwards. They, that's what they concluded. But, um... <laughs> you, you made me forget my point with that. But when, when he dies, you see Takako. She, she, like, falls to her knees, and she, like, holds her head, and she's just screaming. She just breaks. You can see death, it. Death imagery means a lot. I heard that echo really badly. Death, death, the way death is portrayed really um, defines how someone is supposed to interpret it. Obviously, if right. death is crafted better, it'll be more impactful. But I'd, I'd say it compounds with good character development and setting up the character in a correct way. That's exactly... Oh, what was that last part? I uh, just added on for the death. Yeah, for the, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at here, is that... For someone like me, like, I'm, I'm obviously not saying you have to feel the same way, but for someone like me who feels strongly about 80% of the depths in that show, it's because the depths are crafted well. It's because in the context of everything in which they happen, even if the characters who died weren't that well developed, their deaths were sufficiently crafted so that it makes you, it, it evokes some, some sort of emotional response. It doesn't have to be, I cared for these people on a personal level, but just to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You don't have to empathize with. I mean, you don't have to sympathize with them because you don't have. You don't know. I'm with you on that one. Right. Okay. <laughs> Just as long as you can put yourself into the shoes of someone who is holding a girl and trying to, while she's having a nervous breakdown and trying to escape a burning house, and then she gets stabbed in the back, and while she's squirming on the ground, he takes the knife out of her back, and then if if you can if you can relate to that, well, not relate to that. But if you can empathize with that, then that's all that the show is trying to do. The show isn't really trying to have you go on these journey on these journeys with these thirty characters in the class or whatever. I think about thirty characters in the class, and have you ex get close to every single one of them so that you can experience every single one of their deaths on a higher level, right? <laughs> it's it's not trying yeah, to do that. Obviously, didn't have time for that. Right, but even if it did, it probably would have lessened the effect. Because this is just going to happen over and over again. And eventually you're going to realize, you know, diminishing gains. It's going to be a case of, well, why should I even get invested in the first place? Yes, I, I agree. When when it's a matter of a lot of deaths, quick fire, the, the way the death is created and um, invented is far more effective than trying to give them all a small bit of development. Right. I only remembered, I, I didn't remember 30 deaths uh, in in all. That, that would obviously be way too much to develop. I remembered like uh -huh. maybe six, six deaths. Were, see, were there many more? Well, the class was 30, and I think six people survived. 
So oh. <laughs> that uh, that was the worst year of the calamity ever, which is very ironic considering that head of countermeasures, she was probably the second most active and dedicated, maybe maybe the first. Aside are, from, are you saying they, they showed like 30 deaths on screen? Oh no, not 30. They didn't show 30 deaths. 30 people were in the class and only six made it out alive. No, no. Th that would imply that 24 plus six assumed family members died because, you know, they either I, well, it make, so they didn't all die, die too, but at the end, did. you cut out then. If if twenty four students had died, I would assume at least some family members had died. So I just rounded oh, okay. to thirty. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, some family members had died. Like uh, uh, Yukari's mom died. That's why she ran out the classroom, and she died. But, but I was asking if, but, but if no, that it's... many deaths were presented on screen. I only remembered like six, maybe seven. Well, I sort of cheated there. My my bad. It's it's actually there were thirty students in the class. After the teacher committed suicide, like half the class left town. Whether or not they actually made it out alive is who knows. Oh, uh, I see. We know that they went on the beach trip and they made it out alive, and we know that Aya Aya no tried to leave town with her parents and she didn't. We don't know whether or not the other students made it out alive, but they were so spooked by the teachers committing suicide that they couldn't take it anymore, so they left. Everybody else after that, except for six students, died. I can't remember exactly how many. Like if you if you like made me count, I could count exactly how many there were. There yeah, were... it's not very important. I was just yeah. saying that the more deaths you have, the more important it is to craft the deaths artfully, as opposed to trying to cram in development into characters that will obviously die. Right. Yeah. It wasn't twenty four deaths. They didn't go that far. It was there were only six people who who survived and were still in class three. Yes. Most of them were, were minor characters. Well, not most of them. Half of them were minor characters. Half of them weren't. I think six people. No, no, a little more. A little more than six. No more than ten, though. I know yeah, that for yeah. sure. So, so yeah. I what, my, what I'm saying is that I, I agree with you, and that was my point. It's it's more about how you craft a death. But what I don't get is why you think. And of course, it's subjective. I'm not gonna argue that it isn't. But I don't. I just want to know what your opinion for why it didn't catch you the same way it caught me. Anyone in particular, if you want to just bring it up. I believe, I believe your statement on um, not necessarily feeling bad necessarily for the characters, but seeing the imagery and the circumstances surrounding the death and feeling emotion from that was much, much more prominent than actually feeling something for the characters themselves, um, individually, that is. Because I can feel something from the characters because of that imagery. When I see somebody... Yes, but not, not individually for the characters. It's because of how well the death was crafted itself. When I see a character die and the death is crafted well and it's presented in a context in which I'm supposed to empathize with them to some extent, or at least sympathize with them, at least say, Dag, dude. <laughs> it, it makes me feel something for that character individually. I guess... You card with the umbrella that didn't really mean anything to you. Yes. Why? Why didn't she? I, the only thing that it it really expressed to me was that the curse will do pretty much whatever the hell it can to make you die, no matter how illogical and far fetched. Which is true, <laughs> but but that. What's a better way to ask this? What way would you present her to make her a better? display of what a, a proper death should be that, that, that's a good question i i was never under the impression that i was supposed to feel any real emotions I, I thought that was just to show that people will die and that to set the tone for more deaths in the future i, I wasn't under the impression it was supposed to convey emotion but if i was to take the approach of making it convey emotion i would stupid fucking airplane, I would, I'd try and set up some aspect of her character that would at least be common, it could be easily commented upon by a death, for instance, maybe. Yeah, yeah, for instance. An yeah. irrational fear of something that y they end up dying to. That's something that is very cliche and overused, but just for example, it works pretty well. It, it comments upon the thing and it makes you it, it makes you have to at least slightly think from their point of view and understand them 
What about the fact that people just got some sort of irrational fear of umbrellas after they saw that? A lot of people about, and I'm never going to look at umbrellas the same way again. And I bet she wouldn't. <laughs> well, yes, but there's, if anything, it just sets the tone that you should be wary as hell because anything can kill you. But there's nothing about her character that in any way relates to this. Or at least I can't remember anything. Well, she had that one scene where she offered to share her umbrella with Kolichi. But yeah, that, that's not really anything deep. That's just yeah. happenstance. It's just, oh, she she was offering him an umbrella. Oh, she died on an umbrella. Right. Oh, foreshadowing. But it was her umbrella both times. Yeah, but it doesn't really say anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just lying with you. But uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, oh, th this is why I understand her better, though. Because she was... Most of the class, at least May and Izumi would say, that most of the class did not believe the curse to be that much of a threat. They didn't even believe in it, really. That most of them either followed Her it... Her death was used to, to explain that death is here and it will happen, and you can't escape it, even no matter what you do. I, I think that was the main point of her death. It wasn't trying to say anything else. Right, it wasn't trying to say anything else, but it made you feel sorry for what she'd been through before, is what I'm saying. Because nobody else believed in the curse like that. But she did. She was scared out of her mind because he was violating the seal. When he was speaking to May, I mean, when she, she never saw him speaking to May, but she was always checking up on him to make sure he wasn't speaking to May. Every time he said something about May, she, she froze up, which is not like her personality at all. She's, you know, the, the nice girl next door type. It, she not only froze up, but the second time she snapped at him, and then he asked why, and, and then she froze up. She was definitely terrified at the prospect of the curse. And then, not only the fact that she died, but the fact that at first she found out her mother died in a sudden car accident, and then she went out of class just, just horrified because someone had come in the class to tell her that it happened while she was taking a test, and then she, she runs out, and then she goes to grab her umbrella. She sees Mei and Koichi there, and she's like, oh my god, this is it's the curse, it's because of that. So she runs the opposite way, and then what happens is what happens. It is basically the, just seeing somebody being pursued by misfortune like that is what got to me. Expect, but not just being pursued by misfortune, but being pursued by misfortune and trying to have stopped it. Because most of the class didn't give a damn, let's be honest. Yes, I think that plays into the futility we had previously discussed, that you, you can't really do almost anything against it. Yeah, you, you can't. And then because of that, and because she she wanted to stop it, that that is what got to me. And because she didn't deserve what happened to her. At the end of the day, she was a good person. And so you felt a bit sorry for her. At least because of that, because she was an innocent girl who got killed in a very horrible way, which I'm not going to describe in detail, but <laughs> you could obviously the, look her up if you want to know. In that way, but I didn't, I didn't like that it didn't say anything. That that's I understand why it didn't say anything very explicit, because that would just overcrowd the death and make it a bit overloaded on um, narrative meaning. There was and that's, that's usually not a good idea, but yeah. It's just not the kind of death I'm a big fan of. I, I get you, but let me just say this. There wasn't any need to say anything. Because at the end of the day... Yes, like I said, it wouldn't... It would have been a bit too much. The death already had enough purpose. Right, but it said, it said enough to, give, to evoke that feeling. Because at the, at the end of the day, just by having her die like that, it not only warned the class that, that the death was happened, but it just said this character is over. She, she is dead done despite all that she tried to do to, to stop the curse despite her going with Izumi and, and Cosmo to the hospital and despite caring for Koichi and having feelings for him and all that stuff she just saw him with May she freaked out and she died and that's the end of her and she died in a horrible I, way I, not instantly I, either I would say she really does represent futility well but the main different the the main um, differential I'd like to make here is that her death, in particular, didn't represent futility. It represented the fact that death will happen in whatever way it happens. And that's all that really matters in that scenario. Not that the futility itself didn't play into the death, as in, I, I feel you get what I'm trying to get to here. You're saying death will happen with the calamity, or in general, like, you'll, you'll just die, everybody will die one day? 
her character arc was a very good representation of utility, but her death itself, while surrounded by it, it didn't play out as a very futile struggle. It just played out as a sudden death that would embody the um, embody the fact that death is coming. I've reiterated that a few too many times, and that you can't really run away. Mm, not run away from it, that you can't... Eh. Continue. Well, if you can't run away from it, I guess I can't convince you on that part, but if you can't run away from it, despite how much you tried to avoid it, isn't that a, isn't that a bit... Yes, I, I see the fallacy in my argument. Um, I'll, I'll, Unless me, you don't consider death to be sad. I mean, okay, and I know this is an extreme example, so I'm not going to hold you to this, but if you're the type of person who's a sadist, then I could get you not caring at all. But if you're the type of person who's moved by someone trying to avoid death and they're dying, that's probably who they were going for. Her, her death wasn't avoiding it. It was just that death will happen in whatever way it happens. Well, her death that's... wasn't avoiding it, but it was the context of her trying to do yes. whatever she could. She was, she was surrounded by the futile struggle, but her death itself didn't embody it. And that's the main, main difference I'm trying to point out here. I get you, but shouldn't death not occur in a vacuum? I mean, it shouldn't be judged in a vacuum. It should be judged in the context of everything that led yes. up to it. I'm just saying it could have been amplified by that, and that would have been nice. It, it All right, yeah, might it could have been, it could have been, have been a bit too, too much information at once, but it would have been something I would have liked to see. The, the, you're referring to the irony, like if she had had something like, um, not the umbrella irony, but like if she'd had some fear... And that killed her. Like just a, just an aside, like in her backstory. Oh, that, she, that was that was just an example of how a death scene could play out. I, I yeah, I get you. Yeah, that would that would make it probably yeah, probably make it better. But if, if I mean, I'm I'm just saying that it wouldn't make it any worse if they didn't do that, which they didn't. But I, I get your point. It, it would make it would have made it better. Yes. But I, I don't get if how. It complemented the scenes of futility. I would have liked it better, but it was fine as it was. Just for her, because they do that for everybody, pretty much. I mean, I could take you through death after death, and there are some that I really don't give a damn about. Like, there are some people who die, and what the hell, whatever, well, shove off. Well, we can't go through all of the deaths. Right, right. Which which is the one you feel is most important, not not counting easily? Rico. It's easily right Okay, how about, how about one we haven't touched on? <laughs> that, that's, what the, that's what the audience will usually tell you, is, is those two. If it's not we one you... touched on that a bit, just for the sake of this conversation. Yeah, for the sake of this conversation, it would probably be Kyoko and Aki. If you know that they were both stabbed towards the end in that burning house, you, you would probably remember it, right? You remember them? The, the two girls... Very, very... Very vaguely. Who were trying to escape the house and Kazumi killed them. The, the guy with the glasses. He, he stabbed the one and then he... Somehow he threw a knife at the other and it, it got her in the neck. I don't really get how that worked, but it looked painful. And so the, the thing that those deaths did to you is exactly what it did to you with Yukari. Because they saw it coming. Well, well at least one of them saw it coming. And there wasn't anything they could do to avoid it. That's the crux of all of these scenes, is that there is a few, an element of futility involved. And whether or not you think that can get you on a personal level, that should definitely get you on the basis of you're feeling their despair. Because if you're not feeling their despair, then you're not thinking about the situation they're in. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to empathize with them. But you should be able to if you're thinking about the situation. If you're thinking about the fact I'm that... Interested. I'm interested what you um, think about Katsumi's tape. And Katsumi's tape? Yes. What, what about his tape? As in how it relates to the curse's rewriting of history and the like. It doesn't. When you say the rewriting of history, what do you mean? Just to make sure I know what you're saying. As in the curse rewrites history as to not let anyone know of the extra and their death. But wouldn't the tape itself be somehow altered? The tape wouldn't be altered because, well, the tape was created after the extra died. If the extra was brought back to life, then it might have been altered. But the extra only can rewrite history in the context of their death. So, for instance, if Reiko dies after 
spending some summer vac like she dies on some summer trip or whatever. Yes, I understand where my mistake is, and then okay. I'm assuming the curse simply rewrites everything related to it, but in fact, just the thing related to the one person. Right. Yeah. So yeah, the the, the extra was killed by the tape. So what what happens though yeah. is that the people who it, once you kill the extra, if you see it, you remember a little bit longer. But if you're not there, your memories are instantly wiped of the extra's existence. Yeah. Of that year. I, I feel that the team mentioned the extra's name that was currently the extra, but the name itself faded, but not the rest of the contents of the tape. Ooh, lucky. Oh, you're right. That did happen. That did happen, but that's because the extra no longer existed for that year. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah, you, yeah, you have a point. Yeah, the extra, the extra no longer existed. It was as if they had never been reborn, right? It was as if they had always been dead. So he's just speaking in anonymous terms at that point. However, he remembered the fact that he'd put a tape there, even though he didn't remember exactly what had happened, let alone who he'd killed because of his memory, like, not, not his memory, yes. but his, his shell shockness at, at seeing Junta die at the beach. It helped him remember that he'd put a tape there, but that's it. So if you die and you're the extra, everybody will forget about you in time. It'll definitely happen. Yes, the two points at which the curse alters um, the timeline are when the extra is presented and when they are reclaimed. Right, and that's what happened in the main timeline, too. That's what happened with everything re revolving around Reiko and, of course, with uh, Koichi and Izumi. So overall, we can just, you could just end it like this. How did, you, how did you feel about this series? Isn't that a question direct? Isn't that just the question you asked at the beginning? Well, I would like to think that the conversation helped change a few things. I mean... Like I said, I, I have. <laughs> it, it's it's hard to um put it into into any different terms, honestly. Well, the, uh, with the themes that it goes into, do you feel that it is a higher level anime, or I, casual? I, I feel it really does explore the the themes of futility very well with um with Umbrella Girl's death because that's honestly. One of the, or is this just my opinion? You you said you were going to bring up other themes that you believed the show in, embodied. But they're not as important. What were, what were those themes you were about to say? Okay. Just, just well, just, what what were those themes? Well, because <coughs> but, I was of the opinion that futility was its its main theme. It is the main theme. I can't argue that. That is the, by far the most important theme of the yes, show. Yes, and I'll continue on with what I was saying. There I feel also it really the, did. Mm -hmm. I feel it really do well with um, crafting that at the beginning with that person's death and continued on up until the end with with the arguable triumph because it, it wasn't really a triumph it was just the end yeah yeah and I mean, of course it continues the next that, year and after that board theme and that the, the characters at the very least served served that theme in in um not in a vacuum, but away from the other themes quite well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I put it on the same level as yeah. the one with May. Yes, the other ones weren't explored nearly, nearly as well, in my opinion. I, except for the uh, the one with, um, you know, May, May and whether or not you can, you know, just how she operates, how there's yes. something beneath the mask, basically, or how uh, there's always something you don't under you don't understand at first glance. I I was um thinking of her in the context of. Uh, somebody who is not able to be clearly put within terms, as in you can't understand their motivations, not necessarily. The way you phrased it was pretty much the same, but not, not in the sense that hey, they have a mask, but just they themselves aren't even sure of their own motivations. Well, she's sure of her motivations. I mean, at the end of the day, she doesn't care. You can't really argue not, that she's unsure. I'm not really sure she knows this herself, but I'm... I'm rambling and overextending the conversation. We've been doing this for <laughs> how long? An hour forty. Yeah, that's about it. That's about the time to cut it. Well, I wish you good luck in your editing ventures. Um, ho hope the barnyard animals didn't cause you too much trouble. Oh no, no, the sheep helped me get to sleep. I'll sleep well after this. Oh. I just think about. It. But yeah, yeah, it's it's it sounded good on your end. With, if you can count any higher than four, you're gonna have a problem using these sheep to go to sleep, man. Any higher than four? Why is that? Because we only have three, so. Oh, I bet, these, I bet they're in a trio. To four or higher to fall asleep, they're not going to be of that much use. They'd probably, they'd probably uh, repeat <laughs> in unison. But yeah, man, thanks for the conversation.
I hope to speak to you again soon. Actually, screw it. I know we will. <laughs> so it's not even yeah. just leave that hanging. I can't can't put it in words how much I look forward to this and I'm right. But but yeah. <sighs> was was fun, man. I hope to do it again. All right, man. Take care. Thanks again for the convo.